Thank you so much for being here today. If you want to turn to your Kindle Fire, <laughs> where am I at today? Document. The Atonement, the Doctrine of the Atonement. Now that we've learned how to be a genius, let me see if I can find out where this is. We are in the book of Romans. We have worked our way through to verse 32. Romans chapter 8. Let's start with verse 28. And we know. Isn't it good to know? Amen. This I know. Isn't it good to know? There's so many things that we don't know. But there are some things we can know. And this is one of them. That all things work together. And the qualifying is for good to them. This is the qualifier that love God. And to them you are called according to his purpose. Now, we spent six months on that one verse. And I'm not sure we got it yet. For whom he did, verse 29 explains to us, the next several verses are going to explain to us how that's possible. Paul is establishing in verse chapter 8 how we can know we have eternal salvation. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Then verse 31, so then what shall we say about these things? What shall we say about verse 30? Boy, there's a lot of people who say a whole lot of things about verse 30. Predestination, the call, the justified, the glorified. If God be for us, who can be against us? Then verse 32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Shall we pray? Father, we are thankful that you have provided the means whereby we can worship with you today. Thank you for allowing us to meet in this place, to be here at this moment, to be able to present the doctrine of the cross. Thank you for the fellowship we have with you through the Spirit. Thank you for the fellowship we have with those who are with us, visiting with us, and those who are ministering and men, uh, uh, members of our church. May you allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts to conform us to your image. And we'll give you thanks in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> so, we've been asking, the Paul's argument has been, how can we know that our salvation is eternal? Number one is we've been learning how do we know we've been saved? How do we know we have been saved? 
And Paul in chapter 8 clearly gives us indication that we can know we've been saved. Then the question is, how can we know that once we've been saved, that that's everlasting and eternal? In this area, I'm discovering that the majority of the churches do not believe in eternal security or everlasting salvation. And there's a reason for that. Having the wrong doctrine of the understanding of salvation produces in us the inability to accept that we could be saved eternally. When you understand the cross, you understand how it's possible for us to have everlasting salvation. The question, the first point I want to bring out is the necessity of the atonement. Why did Christ have to die? Did Christ have to die? Was it necessary for him to die? It was. Once God decided to save sinners, there was but one way of bringing about this purpose which would be in harmony with God's own character, the law of God, the nature of sin, and the need of man. And this one way was the substitutionary blood atonement of the incarnated Son of God. The unregenerated man, the lost person, cannot believe the gospel simply because he cannot see the real need of an atonement. The, 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 what happened when Adam and Eve sinned, we believe that at that point, Mankind had the inability to understand his need to be saved. We have said on many occasions, I've talked to him blue in the face trying to get a person saved and he doesn't even listen to me. Men on their own do not have the ability to see their need that they need an atonement done for them and they purchase their life. They can't see it. They're blind. <coughs> They're dead to that. There is no way that a lost person... I don't see what's wrong with me. I don't understand why I need to be saved on their own. He does not believe that he is a helpless, depraved sinner that cannot save himself. And the primary reason for this blindness and ignorance lies in the sinner's wrong view of the character of God and his holy and righteous demands that's revealed in his law. As long as God is viewed as nothing but love, we will miss seeing his absolute holiness and perfecting. We tend to think that God wants to save the whole world. If God wanted to save the whole world, guess what? He could. If God chose, in a flash of a second, if He loved the whole world enough to save the whole world, He could do it in a minute. If He chose to. But God loves. So much so, that He provided the means whereby some could be saved. Because he wanted to show grace. You know, that's why sin was invented. If it had not been for sin, there never would have been a Calvary. Had there not been a Calvary, God would not have been able to show his grace and his love and his kindness. God could have never shown his love and not been for sin. God allowed sin to come into the earth to provide the means whereby he could show grace. And God wanted to be praised 
and we praise him for what he's done by saving us out of our sinful condition. Notice, secondly, the nature of the atonement. The nature of the atonement. The question that we're going to ask and try to do today, exactly what did Christ accomplish by his atoning death on the cross? Now listen to me carefully. Listen to me until I finish. The necessity of the atonement answers the question, why? Why did Christ die on the cross? The nature of the atonement answers the question, what? It is over the what that Christians disagree. What? There is a contrasting two groups of people that have two conflicting ideas about what happened on the cross. It's easy to see how differently both groups view the nature of the atonement. If you're a Republican, you cannot figure out how a Democrat can think democratically. If you're a Democrat, you cannot figure out why a Republican acts like a Republican. 